here and diffuse. Uh, we schedule most of our communication outside normal working hours, and, and what you need is also work-life balance. Can I make one comment? Uh, I was talking earlier on the wrong metaphors we use. Um, in fact, um, work-life balance and the word balance is the last thing you want to have in life. Uh, because it assumes if one thing goes up, the other goes down. It's bipolar thinking. And the end result is compromise. Uh, Work-life balance, you do half of your emails at home, so the emails are bad and your family is angry, right? What we need is integration. And I do this on purpose because balance and all these metaphors we use uh, have an assumption. Integration is we create a new reality beyond the old. And, and so you never have to give up your own culture. People don't give up their own culture. They enrich their own culture, and that's called learning. Now, I would like to cover uh, three other areas shortly. And um, I, I love uh, this one, although sometimes the old labels are a bit heavy. But achievement just means that status is based on what you do. And ascription, or attributed status, is status given to you by birth, um, if you like, it's attributed to you by things you can't control. Who you are. Ascribed status are things like family background, age, gender, and not so much what you studied, but where you studied. So, you know, in some cultures this is more important. In other cultures it's cut the crap. You cannot even ask questions about this, right? Because it's about what you do. Now, this is how we measured it. We asked people the following question. The most important thing in life is to act as really suits you, even if you don't get things done. So you understand that achievement-oriented people would disagree with that statement. Look at the disagreement. These are obviously huge differences around the globe. People at the top, and obviously if you look at the history of America, Australia, and Canada, uh, they were people chased by their background. So they said, cut the crap. It's about output, not input. And uh, you go down the line, and it's more, more, much more about input rather than output. But as you know, you need to combine. Now, in, a, in my introduction, I was saying that leadership style is very culturally biased. And, and lately, we have looked at what are leaders that are successful in multicultural groups in international environments. And let me show you, oh, by the way, this is your stretch here. Yeah, a footnote. Janet was reminding me, but uh, perhaps, Mark, would you like to say something about who we invited to fill it in? Because we just didn't want to bother okay. you all with this enormous work. Just to be clear, you participated in an earlier survey that was a longer survey. And in order to avoid survey fatigue and having them at the same time, only a very small group was asked to participate in this survey essentially the program officers, D1 directors, and D2s. So you're seeing this, but the survey itself will be open for you to participate. There'll be links and things like that after this workshop, and you'll be able to look at it and then see how you compare as individuals to the group. Right, and you can get a personal feedback sheet, and especially since there are no good or bad scores. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're left or right, um, because it's just where you're coming from. It's a bit like Myers-Briggs in that sense. You get a little uh, sense. We would love also to hear about your dilemmas, but indeed we didn't want to have another survey on top of you because it takes some time. So this is also vol uh, volu on a voluntary basis. You do if you're feeling okay and you want some feedback. Um, so uh, please do what you like. Now, I love this one because if you only have status based on performance, what you do, the risk is you end up in lost democratic leadership. This is the Dutch or Swedish disease. Is you challenge leaders so often on the basis of their performance that at the end of the day nothing happens and decisions are postponed, right? Is we want, uh, and, and, and Swedes and Dutch are known for it, bottom up and tell me more and, and it drives Finns crazy, for example. So when are they deciding? And, and the Dutch also are, are known for uh, extending uh, periods of decision-making. This is a book title called Lost Democratic Leadership. It's, in fact, too much feedback. Other parts of the world have followed the leader. And the risk is if you don't get enough feedback, you all drop down the cliff. Okay? 
Now, what is a model that works in all cultures? And again, it's a higher complexity leadership, but in fact, you know this, and it's called the servant leader. It's interesting, this is based on the work of um, the, the wonderful guy, Greenleaf. He was 30 years executive with AT&T, and he found out that some leaders at the top were at the top for one year and got away, and other leaders went to the top and stayed there for 20 years very effectively. And he said the difference was the first meeting. The non-sustainable leader came in to his new team, and he explained the team what he expected from them to perform better. And the sustainable leaders came in, and he asked a question to his team members, what can I do to support you better? And that's the servant leader. The servant leader holds the ladder for others to climb. And by doing that, he or she gains more authority. You know that in the Quran, in the Christian Bible, in Hinduism, in Buddhism, shall I go on? In all religions, the icon is a servant leader. Mohammed is a servant leader. Jesus Christ is a servant leader. If you go to Hinduism, Buddha, all busy to enable others to perform better. Now, if that is done by the major religions in the world, there might be a chance there is some truth in that. And I think it's very simple because some of you, I'm sure, have children. Once you have children, you know that the only thing you're in for life is how can I help my children to perform better? Does, is that done at the cost of your authority? You get more authority. The more you serve your kids, the more authority you get. Try that in your leadership role. And first thing in mind, how can I help my people to perform better? And I think this is a wonderful picture because servant leaders are not servants. Servant leaders lead by serving. That's not a servant. So they can be at the top, they can be at the bottom. It depends on, on what is at stake. Um, but they also fire people. But they never do it for themselves. They're always busy with others. Okay? And gee, haven't we made the leadership model awful? If you looked what happened to the last crisis, leaders were just worried about their own pockets. And it's not sustainable. Now, the last two. I think you need to know this between cultures. There are sequential cultures and synchronic cultures. Let me help. We asked people to think about the past, present, and future and to represent that in the shape of circles. And then we looked at how big are the circles and how much is the overlap. And we had people who, who drew circles like this and they're rather sequential. Sequential people, I'll have a look here. Isn't that interesting? And we just looked at... Uh, some uh, Middle Eastern countries. You see, we play a bit with regions and with industry, and so you know the diversity of diversity. We also looked not only at size, but also overlap. And um, have a look. Oh yeah, this is the size of past, present, future of the group here. And let's have a look what sequential people tell you. Sequential people, first of all, believe in you do one thing at a time. And 145 or the 1st of February is the 1st of February. And you end up at 3 o'clock sharp, right? Now, these are sequential people, and they, they are very well organized, step by step. Synchronic people, and you find them in the Latin world, rather do things in parallel, right? You know Italians, they are in the car, they shave themselves, they have a phone call, right? They do PP if it allows the car, and... They, they go all the and they, they do things in parallel. And you recognize them because 1.45 might become 2 o'clock and 3 might become 3.15. And when you're doing things in parallel, it doesn't matter that people are a bit late. Now, in project management, what is better? Again, both. And what we have learned from the Japanese is that the best way to speed up a sequence is to synchronize it. And that's called just-in-time synchronizing sequences, right? Because they both have advantages and disadvantages. Now, the final point is, do we control our environment as a culture? Do we want to control our environment? 
or is the environment controlling us? And that is shown by the boxer or the judoka. At the boxer, I play my own game, and the judoka, let's wait and see for a weak moment of my opponent. So one is uh, in football, the left-hand side is English football, you remember when they won? Uh, 1972, it was their last win. But it was uh, kick and rush, you know, it was the game of, it doesn't matter who we play, we play our own game. And they lost. Judo in football is called catanaccio, it's the Italian game. You wait and see for the weak moment, you attack and you win. Now, obviously, top football is the combination, right? Um, we ask people, what happens to me is my own doing, internally controlled, versus sometimes I feel I do not have enough control over the direction my life is taking. It's done by others. Have a look. We play our own game. Let's wait and see. Okay? Now... That means a lot. If you don't understand this, again, a morning, you can do a five-day workshop. It's like le learning a language. You cannot explain everything. But in, in project management, this is very important. People sometimes don't believe they can control things, and others are the control freaks. What is the best way to combine? Now, first of all, we see some kind of a middle score in this one. The balanced scorecard. Uh, internally controlled people very often are focused on business processes, control. Uh, externally controlled people very often sensitive to the outside world, clients and that kind. They want to please clients. And the balanced scorecard is one of this. So, do you go for inner directed improvement in business processes or rather for customer satisfaction? And correct the line, if you overdo one, it's lean but mean. And this is the customer's creature. You know, uh, you're, you're just following, rubbing the legs of the, of the customer. And what we have found, and, and uh, let, let me give you two examples. First of all, Philips, our Dutch company, they were very good in uh, technology here. And they found out that it was sold by Sony. <laughs> Philips almost invented anything in consumer electronics you can imagine, uh, from the CD-ROM to the DVD, and Sony sold it. So they said, gee, we need more marketing. And there was Bonestra, a guy from uh, the marketing... Uh, food industry who put marketing in Philips. And it was interesting, Philips at a certain moment had great technology and great marketing. The only problem left is they never talk to each other. <laughs> so it's not either or or and and, it's through through. How can you create a spiral that is called pushing through the pool? Let me give you a second example. Uh, let's say Ahmad, I'm your boss. Ridiculous, but I'm your boss. And we have an appraisal talk, a function talk, I don't know how you call this in the project, but I said, Ahmad, can you tell me a bit, what, how did you feel about the last six months? And uh, Ahmad says, um, yeah, Fons, uh, I did SAP implementation and it was a success. I said, great, we have to call SAP first time in their history. And um, isn't it great? Yeah, great. Ahmad, what have you done with the clients lately? I said, Fons, I was so busy with this task force. I didn't have time to go to the clients. Now, that's called the balance scorecard, right? You do one at the cost of the other. And the boss understands. I want you in this kind of, and, and in multicultural teams, that will work. But now it's perhaps corporate culture, that there is a very client-oriented uh, company and a more business process company. And you work together. Ask the following question, because you're in the middle of the two. I said, Ahmad, can you tell me, how have you used your customer last year? that help you to get a better SAP implementation. And Ahmad, can you show me how SAP has helped you to serve a client better? And we'll use it as a new book, yeah? Because it has never been published. But uh, you, you get the point? That's called the integrated scorecard, pushing through the pool, connecting the client, the inner world with the outer world. Now, can I give you a summary of what I was telling? And a summary is always risky because people say, he took two hours, and I, I thought his summary was much clearer, yeah? We are living in an increasingly perceived, diverse world. You witnesses in your project. Our research over 25 years have not given any sign that diversity is decreasing. But it's more, let's say, clear 
in our minds because through internet, through traveling, movement of people, and we are feeling that our paradigms are running out of juice. If you are dealing with multicultural environments, you need new paradigms. And, and I've given you examples on reward systems, on appraisal systems, on structural issues, global versus local. I've given you examples in leadership, servant leader. And these are not one side is more important than the other. No, they are still important, but you have to enrich yourself. And that's what I wanted to show you with one after the other example. And what is cultural about it, that the dilemmas become clearer when cultures get together. But the dilemmas are the same. Every culture needs internal processes, and any culture needs to serve a client. But some start with the client and say, oh, our processes, and others start with the processes, say, oh, I forgot the client, right? And you as leaders need to connect. Now, I would like to give you a, um, now, the last one here, internal and external control. Let us take uh, a final summary of this all, because some of you might say, yeah, is there a model of corporate culture? And I go quick, but you will recognize this. Namely, this was the other side of my research. There is an egalitarian and more hierarchical culture, and person and task-oriented culture. And you see the Anglo-Saxon model, if you ask a typical American, what is the essence of your company? They talk about strategy, management by objectives, and pay for performance. Right? That's the Anglo-Saxon model. In ideology, it's egalitarian. Everybody can get at the top. And it's task-oriented. You ask a Middle Eastern, Latin, Asian, African person, it's all about who do you know? It's management by subjectives, namely you do it for the boss. Who has a task, by the way? And finally, what motivates people is the accumulation of power. This is 90% of the world, so you better understand that, right? <laughs> then we go with the Germanic model, and you ask the typical German, Karl Heinz, what is the essence of your company? The first thing they want to show is structure. You manage by job description. And what motivates the German mind is the accumulation of expertise. That's why titles in German business are still accepted. A doctor, professor, doctor, doctor is great. In America, if you have a title, you hide it because people might find out you have thought about a subject, which is the end of your career. Yeah? They say, poor chap, an expert. Then we have the incubator, egalitarian and person oriented, organized chaos, management by passion, and it's all about learning. Now, it's interesting that uh, Larry Greiner, an American scholar, has once showed that, in fact, good companies, mature companies, combine the four. In your project, you better do that. And that is, he says, you very often start as an incubator that needs a family culture, that needs a guided missile. <clears throat> so this is about creativity. This is about relationships, uh, cooperation. This is about task orientation strategy, and this is about execution. And he says, very often in the development of organizations, and he followed 800, it goes from the incubator to the family, from the family to the guided missile, from the guided missile to the Eiffel Tower, and back. And by the way, he calls this infinity loop the infinity loop of innovation. I wanted to show you this because you will see, and, and we don't have enough time for that, but in these models, and, and there is some reading material about it. Decisions are made differently. Management of change is done differently, etc., etc., etc. Let us go to uh, the dilemma stuff because I want you to work on this stuff. And you already see you have some of the flip charts uh, close to your table. Um, first of all, don't worry about the word dilemma. Dilemma comes from the Greek and it means two propositions in conflict. So a dilemma is always two positives, where you say, wow, if I go for one side, I lose the other side. So let's take centralized and downwards, decentralized and upwards. Crack the line and make it a circle. You can centralize the knowledge of an activity that is decentralized. That's our human body. The more we decentralize our activities, even to unconscious things, the more we need information about that activity to not disintegrate, right? This is what we would do with you. So 
you crack the line and you open the culture space. And then you hope you get this, better centralized knowledge of ever more decentralized activity, as an example. Be careful, because this might happen too. Yeah? You eat each other alive. Now, Nadia, you, you just were out of the room, but I was saying, putting a cultural issue on the table is very important. This is a method of doing it. And we have six steps. And I would like you to, uh, first of all, look at some of the takeaways. And then we'll go to this business. Yeah, I, I would like to run through all the bullet points and then we'll go to the dilemma stuff. First of all, culture, always use it in the context of business. Don't do, you know, let, you could do culture uh, and uh, let me tell you something about the Asians. Let me tell, it's fine, but if you say, you, have a, you know, I have a problem of meeting a deadline, link cultural issues with business issues. <coughs> Second point. Start with the business issue. What is your problem? What is your dilemma? And then get into culture. Don't get into culture and then suddenly you see all the problems. Right? And frame them as dilemmas. On the one hand, we want to be flexible. On the other hand, we have to meet deadlines. And that's culture, fine. But, but frame the dilemma and then work on the dilemma with your team. Look at all levels, not only national. Create a process of constructive dialogue, which we're doing now. Celebrate the similarities while working on the differences. And I, I, by the way, I've, I've seen in what the pre-work was that Janet showed me, you, you are uh, built to last. It's only making it work now. And, and I know many of you will do that very soon. Um, work on low-hanging fruit, key issues. What is the real key issue rather than all the issues? And uh, yeah, I, I would say develop inclusive leaders uh, that uh, will make yourself much more, let's say, effective. And inclusion just means work on what you share, uh, so you're, you're part of the same game. Once you are part of the same game, you can work with differences quite easily. Now, we'll practice. Here are the dilemmas. I'll come back to those dilemmas. Yeah, there are many more dilemmas, as you know. But I want to stimulate your mind. At the table, later on, I'll ask you to choose a dilemma and work on it. And by the way, to manage some of your expectations, this is not an exercise where you say, dilemma solved, we can go home. This is half an hour. Normally, you need two hours to really work it out. And if you have a, an, an issue, don't immediately say that's a cultural issue. It's a business issue. Later, you can explain that culture has a lot to do with it. But who cares, because culture is so rich. National culture, corporate culture. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. You have a problem. And work on it. Right? OK. Later on, I'll come back to that, and you can make a choice per table. If you don't like these dilemmas, redefine a dilemma you are having in your project team or whatever. And I don't mind if it's only one person. The other will help him or her. Yeah? OK. Now, six steps. First of all. What is the dilemma? Now, we helped you, right? You can do it as a leader. So if you have a team and say, listen, what are the issues? And ask people to frame the issue as a dilemma on the one hand, on the other hand. That opens a fantastic positive atmosphere. Say, hey, there are two sides to this, right? Then chart the dilemma. Charting the dilemma is, in fact, two things. Crack the line, charting and make the dilemma as specific as possible. Because if we go back here, they are still sometimes a bit abstract. Make them more concrete. That's part of step two. Okay? Then stretch the dilemma. is positives and negatives on both sides. By the way, you will see on, on your uh, A4 uh, that we will distribute in a second huh? um, that, that there are boxes for positive and, and negative. And then epithets are the cartoons I used. In 110, 10, 1, and 5, 5 are uh, here are the boxes. There are um, cartoons to show you you don't want to be there. So make them negative. Uh, especially English people are very good at that. Yeah? They are bloody cynical. 
uh, for Americans, be politically incorrect. It's a wonderful feeling, by the way, because finally you tell the truth. Yeah? And, uh, and, and that's a wonderful feeling. It's such an, ah, oh, I can tell the truth. Yeah? And, and don't worry, because it's part of the exercise. And then reconcile the dilemma is really asking the question, how can value X give me more of value Y and vice versa? And then what is the design action? So it's not rocket science. But obviously, it's not always easy. I think one to four is very easy. But five, how one can help the other, you need a bit of thinking and creativity. OK? So here, this is the chart that you are getting. We have uh, number one. On the one hand, on the other, you choose a dilemma. Number two, you chart the dilemma by labeling X and Y, but as concrete as possible. Then you stretch the dilemma, pluses and minuses, for uh, both sides. Then you get the epithets. And then finally, the action point and how to implement. That's it. You have half an hour for that. And you will see it's peanuts, because normally you get one hour and a half for it. Yes. Yes, and please use the, you know, make a dual axis on uh, and, and share it amongst the group if that is helpful. Okay? And I'll be walking around. Here are the dilemmas again. Choose one and work on it. 